Hey, this is Dan Miller, host of the 48 Days to the Work You Love podcast. Here's a sample listener question. Dan, I barely graduated from college with a 2.4 GPA. Two job failures have now ended my career with irreversible damage. I'm back living with my parents and have decided that aiming for nothing will at least lessen my disappointment. Are you kidding me? Irreversible damage? Those failed jobs are probably the best part of your education. Do you know the average GPA of millionaires in America is 3.7? Instead of going to grad school or getting a fancy job, they figured out something they were passionate about and knocked it out of the park. Every week, we unpack listener questions and find creative solutions for finding or creating work that is fulfilling, purposeful, and profitable. Check it out on the 48 Days to the Work You Love podcast. Let's face it, money is the one subject we all need to deal with, but no one actually wants to talk about. The good news is there's a podcast helping you learn everything about money no one taught you. Meet Everyone's Talking Money, hosted by me, Shauna Game. Everyone's Talking Money focuses on relevant, inclusive, and forward-thinking conversations around money and just helps you get in a better relationship with your money no matter what your goals are. Do yourself a favor and subscribe to Everyone's Talking Money podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Here to live, laugh, and learn because this is episode number 233 of Tennis Podcast. I'm Nick Amell. Every week, me and my sidekick host cover a new top tennis list along with fun facts, trivia, and hot takes. Today, I am joined by a tennis podcast virgin, possibly a virgin overall, don't know, but either way, that's fine. Making his sidekick host debut, Trevin Barty. Trevin? Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, a longtime listener, first time sidekick host. So nice to, nice to be on here. Uh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Makes two of us. Trevin, you're the co-host of the podcast Live, Laugh, Larceny, hence my very clever intro. Mm -hmm. It's a true petty crime podcast. I'd love for you to tell the folks a little more about you, uh, your butt, and also your podcast. Just oh, get, let them get to know you I and your butt. I am so glad you brought up my butt. So we're actually really big into butts, too, uh, on our show. Yep. So I'm, I come from a music background. I decided to jump into podcasting, but I didn't really know exactly what to do. Somebody kind of asked us to do a true crime thing, and I said, I'll do it, but I'll do it my own way. We decided to uh, go with a bit of a variety show approach. I like to think of it as sort of a, like a key and peel sort of goofy <laughs> way you come in, yeah. you warm up the people with a warm up, and then we go into our stories. Our stories are making fun of, they're, they're a parody of true crime. My co-host Amanda is a big fan of true crime. I'm, I like some and I don't like others, but uh, I wanted to make, f like, have fun with how over-serious a lot of true crime podcasts are. We do our show from, like, an over-dramatic millennial scope. So every story is a dumb criminal story or dumb petty crime, and I use my audio skills to do mm -hmm. background music, goofy sound effects, and we take something as small as like a cell phone thief and making it sound more serious than some podcasters may make a murder sound. I highly recommend Live Laugh Larceny to anyone listening. There will be a link in the show notes. Trevin, what's a random fun fact about you other than the podcast? Let's see, random fun fact. I was a victim of a petty crime. Hmm. I uh, was jumped by a couple guys with a samurai sword. Tell me more. <laughs> in Phoenix, Arizona, I went there for audio school, and it was my first week there. And we decided just to take a walk to Walmart. And on our way back... Mm. First mistake. Yeah. On our way back, a dude uh, jumped... Or well, one dude was walking beside the sidewalk behind a bunch of bushes. Another guy was walking directly at us, and something didn't seem quite right. And I was with a friend who had actually... That was his first day there. He was actually considering moving mm. in with us. And he got a little a little excited and kind of put up his dukes and one of the guys punched him to the ground and was like, are you sure you want to do that? And then he showed us his weapon, which I didn't know what he was about to show us. And he, sh he pulls out a full size katana Fuck. and it was just so hard to take it seriously in the moment. After my friend was on the ground, uh, attempted to stab him. It, it seemed like a, a full on execution. Wow. And uh, 
I had told myself like, hey, I'm going to grab this guy and throw him into the traffic because we're right next to a bunch of moving vehicles. I ended up slipping on the curb and blacking out for like a quick second. And uh, in the moment, I had actually tackled the guy, kind of half-assed tackled him. He pushed the blade forward and my friend grabbed the blade with both of his hands. The motion of me pushing into him cut my hand or my friend's hands across both palms. And uh, it was kind of a big mess, but he ended up, they said if he would have went any deeper, he would have lost, he would have cut all the tendons in every single one of his fingers. Wow. Yeah, it was. Uh, so it was, what happened? The guys ran away after that? Yeah. Or maybe um, you ran away. <laughs> he grabbed the sword with his bare hands. And after the dude had fell down to the ground with me, my uh, friend had thrown the sword into the traffic so they didn't have it anymore. Mm. And then when I got up, the second guy with him took a cheap shot on me and they both retreated to a parking lot where there was already a running car waiting for him. <sighs> Trevin, I mean, I feel like we <laughs> should just end the show now. I mean, I don't know if we topped that. You should just do a podcast about that experience. I've done it once in my show where I kind of highlighted the funny sides of it. Uh, we ended up going to get help at a gas station and the gas station clerk was just done. The, the floors were freshly mopped and we went and poured blood all over his freshly mopped <laughs> floor. And you could just see the look in his eyes. He was like, oh, fuck. It's truly like a skit in a sketch comedy or something. But there, to your point, there, that's the funny side. But there's also a very dark, scary side where you were executed on the side of the road. <laughs> well, surprise, I have the man with the samurai sword on the line here to confront you now. Uh -oh. Just kidding. <laughs> that's a crazy story. And I... You said you covered that on your show. I, I have not heard that story yet. So yeah, it was an thank older you for one. Sharing that. Yeah. I also told it on Let's Not Meet actually uh, a couple weeks ago. Well, Trevin, I want to meet your top 10 list and I'm going to assume it doesn't have to do with samurai swords. Nope. There are no samurai swords in this list. So okay. I'm going to be doing the top 10 pettiest crimes as told by Live Laugh Larceny. Okay. See, I, I compiled this list and then I thought more about it and uh, I realized that a lot of your guests usually have more data to reference. And then I listened to your episode with uh, Tim and Lance when they did the, <laughs> yeah. the uh, weird city names and I know that they did the, the draft together. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I, Amanda and I sort of kind of did a draft of our own here and we're focusing on the pettiest crimes, like emphasis on the word petty. Uh, so it's not like the biggest crimes we've ever done. It's not the greatest hits that we've done, but it's the ones that I feel like they are driven with petty spite and revenge. I love it. So this is a top 10 list of the pettiest of petty crimes that you have covered on your show. Correct. Okay. And I know you like to guess things. I know this makes it a little harder because it it's not coming from data. If you want to throw out a guess... Of anything, we can go that route. Um, a lot of these have a little bit of twists and turns, and I will ask you what you think will happen next, and we okay. will learn together. Okay, so something that's not on the list, right? Oh, God, where do you start? <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> okay, well, this is fresh on my mind because I just listened to it today, but the gentleman that wanted to meet the Pope in mm. the Vatican... And he didn't get his way, so he decided to break a 2,000-year-old statue on display. It is not on the top 10. Okay. We're going even pettier. Yes, much okay. pettier. All right. Well, then you might have to give me a hint here. Point me in the right direction. Okay. So, I know that you're a cat fan. Oh, yeah. I have a cat crime on here for you. And you're wearing a cat shirt. I'm wearing a cat I'll shirt. i assume that was intentional. Yes. Uh, you and I have a lot in common with our love for butts and cats. <laughs> and <laughs> hey, I no, no, no. Some butts I love, some butts I don't love. It's not a one size fits all. Okay. Literally. <laughs> yeah. So, a cat crime, okay. So, I have a cat crime at number eight. So, do we want to start with that one? Does it have to do with like stealing a cat, kidnapping? Nope. And this is also uh, a fun one for us because this is the oldest crime we've ever done. It is from January 24th, oh. 1914 in New York City. Oh, shit. I think uh, I have a sidekick host, Brad Choma. I think he might have been around during that time. But <laughs> 1914 in New York City, cat crime. Okay. Not a cat burglar. No. An actual cat. Okay. Tell me about it. We've got beef. Everybody loves beef. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but we can go with that. 
So a police officer named James Kinney was walking around James Street, and he heard a strange commotion coming from the Brighton. Stop. Sorry. <laughs> Don't mean to cut you off already. Okay. The guy's name is James, and he's walking down James Street? Yeah. All right. Very <laughs> serious. to call that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please proceed. He's walking around James Street, and he hears a strange commotion coming from Brighton Beef Company. Brighton Beef Company, I think there was some speculation that maybe there's some mob involved with this company. Apparently, like six months before, a bomb had exploded in front of this beef company, and it had been rebuilt. And so the cop was immediately called back up because, you know, he didn't know if it was another bomb situation. He was unable to get through the door. They had other cops show up. They threw a young cop through the window to go see what the commotion was. He lands inside and finds 25 cats inside. Okay. <laughs> there were no arrests made, but they did find, they do believe that it was a rival beef company in town that captured 25 cats, starved them, and then threw them through that same window overnight. By the time they had got to it, all of the company's beef had been eaten by these cats. Wow. I have a lot of questions, but is that the end or is there more? Unfortunately, this one is one that doesn't have a lot. Being from 1914, it was... Yeah, there's not a lot on that one, unfortunately. 1914, I mean, I know it's only, you know, 100 and... Less than 110 years ago, mm -hmm. but might as well be a thousand years ago, honestly, the way, the way the world works. And I also love the idea that, you know, the only time to report news in those days was a newspaper or word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So most people are hearing about this story at the time in a newspaper. I assume it was reported in one at the time. Yep. So Rival Meat Company, in order to harm, what are they called? Brighton? I think Brighton. you said Brighton. Yep. Brighton Beef. In order to harm them, they put starved cats into their building to eat the meat and ruin their product, ruin their profits. Yep. So I got that right? <laughs> yeah, okay. the, the noise was just the hungry cats fighting each other for the meat. Do we know if the cats made it out okay? They said that uh, no cats were harmed. No cats were harmed, period. Wow, okay. Yeah, one guy went to the hospital because they said that he accidentally reached and grabbed a cat's tail and he got scratched and had to go to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only injury there. That's what you fucking get. <laughs> But these cats, I feel bad for them that they were starved and also abandoned in this building. I feel good for them that they had fucking kitty buffet of all buffets in mm -hmm. there, it sounds like. All this meat. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, they were starved, but it's not too bad to the animals to where I feel really bad covering it, which is nice. Yeah. And who hasn't been around a beef plant that had a bomb and a bunch of cats inside? I mean, we've right. all been I, there. So it's very relatable. You put me in a beef plant and it'll be like a bomb went off anyway. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> okay. Are there any more kitty crimes on the list? I don't have any more kitty crimes. Oh, actually, I, well, I do actually have a kitty adjacent crime, yes. A kitty adjacent crime. A dog? It has to do with cat poop. I'd say that's kitty adjacent. Maybe even more so, because it's not next to the cat. Well, I guess it ends up next to the cat. Starts inside. Mm -hmm. Makes its way out. So, so yes. this is actually number seven on the list. In 2014, a 58-year-old St. Louis man named Javons Brown was really needing a job. But he wasn't one of those people that complained about needing a job, but then didn't actually try. This dude was like trying to get tons of jobs. But unfortunately, his willpower alone didn't really get him there. Mm. So he ended up doing over 20 job interviews and still got no job offers. I might have kind of spoiled the guessing game on this side because I already told you it were kitty adjacent, but what do you think this petty, petty man did when he didn't get any jobs? <laughs> he did something with kitty poo-poo. Mm-hmm. Did he burn it in a brown paper bag? Nope. It's a little more thought out than that. All right. Tell me. So Javon's got into his kitty litter box, scooped out all the cat turds, <laughs> and mailed each company that didn't hire him a bunch of cat shit. <laughs> The United States Postal Service and investigators were able to trace back 20 different packages of poop back to Javon's. He was charged with mailing injurious articles. He injurious later, articles? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he later pled guilty to the misdemeanor and landed himself two years of probation. And I guess uh, for anybody who doesn't know, mailing poop is against the law due to it being a health hazard. After the event, Assistant U.S. Attorney John Bodenhausen said in court that this was, quote, not a victimless crime. Uh -huh. Stepping up and naming postal workers, people whose mail was adjacent to Brown's, and the employees who had to touch the packages. So those are your victims, if you didn't already His know. His last name was Brown, also? Yeah. 
Okay, so the first guy, we got James <laughs> on James Street, and now we got Brown sending Brown packages. This is literally a cat shit Unabomber. Yeah. You know, the. <laughs> it's a, but did this guy not think it would be traced back to him? You know, I don't really know what he was thinking. It seemed very easy for them to find him. And yeah. But yeah, he. I'm fine with this one. If you want to send the cat shit, send it. You know what my favorite part of the whole thing is? That this cat, his cat, is shitting in this litter box. They don't give a fuck where its shit ends up. Doesn't even know. Right. So that cat's just living its best life shitting in a box and its shit is being mailed across the continental United States. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not a lot of cats can be happy to know that their shit had more than one purpose, you know? Yeah, that's right. I'm loving this list because so far we got two kitty and kitty adjacent crimes. Mm -hmm. We're done with cats, are there, though. Are there any other animals related? I've got insect. I've got an insect crime if you want to go that way. See, and I'm frustrated, too, because I've listened to a few of your episodes and I'm not recalling any of these. I tried not to do too much that's uh, super recent, so that might also be a yeah, problem. That might be part of it. Um, okay, insect. Does it have to do with getting someone intentionally bit by an insect or stung? Stung. Booyah. This is why I host the Top 10 Podcast, Trevin, because I guessed it. It's number... Number... Five. Four. Knew it. You're close. So we're going to talk about a lady named Rory Susan Woods. Oh, she's not named Rory Insect or Rory... <laughs> Rory B. <laughs> Rory Wasp. <laughs> this is a thing all about protesting. Protesting is an important part of our country. We all have the right to do it, as long as our government allows it for the most part. Sounds like hippie shit, but all right. <laughs> but one thing you should never do if you're planning a protest is don't invite a Batman villain. Huh. Okay. In a town called Long Meadow, outside of Boston, Massachusetts, local citizens were protesting the eviction of Alton King Jr.'s $1.5 million home. In 2006, there's this guy named Alton King who... Listener of the show. Oh, yeah, listener of the show. Right. He had a million-dollar house, and he decided after two years that he wanted to put on a full-sized basketball court and an apartment for his mother because she was aging. Building it cost him about $410,000, but apparently his mortgage had jumped from $3,000 a month to $13,000 a month due to mm. what King describes Ouch. as shady business practices and predatory lending. Hmm. The home was well known in the community. Some NBA players would play pickup games there, and the 2006 Goober nah, gubernatorial, I hate that word, fundraiser was held there for a, a governor hopeful. So the community knew, knew the place pretty well. So when King filed for bankruptcy and was evicted by the bank, many people in town were aware and pretty angry about it. It was a textbook protest, everything was going according to plan, until 55-year-old Rory Susan Woods showed up. Now, she had actually just been evicted one month earlier, so she had a major bone to pick with the whole eviction process. Major B to pick. Exactly. So the 55-year-old woman loaded up a trailer with crates of beehives, donned a white wow. beekeeper outfit, and drove it to the spot of the protest. Officers attempted to stop her, but once she started smashing crate lids, they backed off. Rory dumped one crate over, sending a swarm of bees over protesters, the movers that were hired by the bank, and police. She also picked up another tower of bees and just started walking it towards the front door. I have questions, but I'll hold them. She was eventually subdued and arrested on four counts of assault and battery by means of dangerous weapon, three counts of assault by means of dangerous weapon, and one count of disorderly conduct. They're calling the bee the dangerous weapon, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess it is because some people are allergic and all that. She could have killed somebody, right? With the bee sting. And they said a lot of people, I guess, on the force or whatever that were there were already allergic. And one guy did go to the hospital. Um, but it was just one guy. And they had said, had something really bad happen to him, this would have gone way more south for her. Yeah. So what happened to her? Do you know? No. Unfortunately, the thing about our show, which really sucks, is a lot of people get their charges and then everything else isn't really out there, you know? what gets settled in court and stuff like that because it's just not that big of a deal to people. I don't know why. It's important to me. What a petty crime that is because it's so creative, first of all, and unique and the effort involved to get all these... Be she must have been a beekeeper in her spare time or something to... She's got to be if she knows what she's doing with it. But if she just got evicted, did she have... Was she like kicked out and then her and the bees had to go, you know, <laughs> stay at a, a long-term motel for a while? Like, 
I want to know what had to happen. Her, her and the bees were under the overpass. Yeah. <laughs> on the highway, like in a homeless tent. I don't know, man, but it's elaborate. I'll give her that. Yeah. She wanted revenge and she thought the bees were the best way to do it. But I don't know. Maybe just fucking egg their house or something. It just seems easier. But yeah. Huh. She's such a Batman villain. That's the most thought out right. and big, grandiose. And she had a whole suit that went along with it. Yeah, she came in a beekeeper suit, right? Like the whole white thing with the mm-hmm. like the big helmet thing. Like there's so actually she was pictures protected from the bees. of her oh, really? okay. like getting subdued. It's it's pretty good looking. It's it's fun. Yeah. Damn. Okay. I don't know if it gets any better than this, but apparently it does because the bee thing was number four, and there's three more above it. Yes. Ads suck, right? Ads are the worst. And I feel bad for you that you're hearing my shitty ad right now because your fellow listeners are skipping this very ad even as we speak. Tennis Pod Plus members never hear an ad on Tennis Podcast ever. They don't even know this ad exists. You could stop fucking around and join them on the new and improved Tennis Pod Plus. It's now easier than ever to sign up. It takes literally about 10 seconds. Better yet, after sign up, you can add the Tennis Pod Plus feed into your favorite podcast app in just one tap including Spotify. That's right, no extra apps or know-how needed to enjoy Tennis Podcast episodes early and ad-free in the podcast app you're already using. Plus, get exclusive members-only bonus episodes you can't hear anywhere else. We have over 60 bonus episodes available right now, with more added every month. You can also upgrade to the new Peanut Butter Fiend plan to get all of these benefits, plus a free shirt, mug, or hat after sign-up. You'll also get to choose the top 10 list for an upcoming episode, and you'll gain exclusive access to our new blooper reel every month. Peanut Butter Fiends can also watch a full video format of every week's episode unedited and uncut. To get started, just go to TennisPod.com plus. Pick the plan that's right for you, starting at just $2.99 per month. And all plans come with a free seven-day trial. Try it out and cancel anytime, no commitment. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, you can also sign up from right within the Apple Podcast app. Just go to our Apple page and tap the Try Free button at the top of the page. With just one tap, your tennis podcast feed will instantly refresh with all of our ad-free and bonus content unlocked. It's that simple. Go to TennisPod.com slash plus to join now for your free seven-day trial. After that, you'll never hear an ad like this one again. Look at you. You're filthy. I was filthy once too, just like you. But I freshened up, and that's why I want to tell you about our newest sponsor, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. If you're anything like me, cooking and meal planning is a chore. I hate it. It's so tempting to pick up the phone and just order some delivery. But hold that phone, fam. When life gets busy, don't call for delivery. Just get HelloFresh. It's 25% cheaper than takeout and less expensive than grocery shopping, too. With HelloFresh, all you need is 15 minutes and you'll be enjoying a tasty, satisfying meal made in your very own kitchen. HelloFresh saves me a ton of money and, more importantly, time. It gives me so much more of the extra time I need to edit out all of Dr. Buster's many mistakes on Tennis Podcast. Well, maybe not all the extra time I need, but pretty close. My favorite thing about HelloFresh is the variety. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner are all covered. They even have snacks and sides, too. Now I need you to freshen up just like I did. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 tennis and use code 50 tennis for 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash 5010ISH and use code 50 tennis or just simply click the link in the show notes and you'll get 50% off free shipping and you'll help support Tennis Podcast all at the same time. So what are you waiting for, you filthy animal? Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50 tennis and use code 50 tennis and you'll immediately see why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. I used to start my day feeling unrested, unfocused, and in need of a caffeine boost. But that was old Nick, because new Nick has discovered a life hack. It's AG1, the daily nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I drink AG1 every single morning because in just one delicious daily serving, AG1 gives me the comprehensive foundational nutrition I need to support energy, focus, strength, and clarity with 75 high quality vitamins, probiotics, and whole food sourced ingredients. It's the best way to start your day. 
AG1 is not only a high quality all-in-one solution for daily foundational nutrition, it also saves you time, confusion, and money because each serving costs less than just $3 a day. That's not a lot compared to individual supplements that can add up or for a daily habit that gives you powerful long-term results. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash tennish. That's drinkag1.com slash 10ish. Check it out. How about we get things a little hot and heavy and talk about making love? Oh, baby. I don't know if I'm ready for this. Um, okay, let's do it. I got a couple lovemaking stories, but number 10 on the list is one of my favorites. Does it have to do, let me guess first, does it have to do with getting back at someone by having sex with someone else, something in that arena? Nope. Okay. Tell me then. Okay. So, Monroe, Connecticut, 2018. 52-year-old Robert Somley and a 48-year-old unknown coworker, female, co-worker mm-hmm. they were landscaping at someone else's home the two were loading wood into a trailer until robert had to leave because he needed a break loading all that wood will do that to you yeah 20 minutes later the co-worker went to go check on him because he never came back as she walked into the home of the people that they were working for she saw him standing in the middle of their house watching porn and pleasuring himself <laughs> oh my God. the woman walked in and said asked him what he was doing he said he needed to relieve himself sexually before finishing work. No, and I was going to say, Trevin, do you mind if we take a break real quick? <laughs> I, I, need, I just feel this pressure building up. Oh, yeah. I can give you about 20 I'll if take you need it. <laughs> okay. I won't need 20, I promise you, but yeah. Okay. So is there more to the story? Oh, there's much more. Okay. Okay. She goes back outside to finish the job. She just says, like, what are you doing? He says, I need to relieve myself. And she's like, all right, cool. I'll go back to work. I have a problem with that, but all right. I do too. It sounds so weird. And that's actually from her statement. So I'm like, What? Like, how do you not question that more? A little later, she returned to find Robert still naked with the laptop. But this time... Oh, he's naked, too. Yeah, he was naked watching the laptop. You didn't tell me he's naked. Yeah, he was naked. I mean, look, (laughs) that's not the worst part of the whole thing. The worst part is the jerking off in someone else's home. But you had to get completely naked to do it? Right, you couldn't just do a quick job. (laughs) (laughs) It's called jerking off because you can just do it real quick. You just jerk in, jerk out, jerk off. (laughs) Okay, okay, so he's naked. She sees him naked, all right. Go ahead. She says, okay, fine, I'll go back to work, whatever. So she comes back again, still naked, but this time he's pouring syrup on his body. Well, that I get. Yeah. You got to. Yeah. Everybody just wants to be a short stack of flapjacks. (laughs) So I know that when I'm naked and I'm pleasuring myself, the thing I want most is to be uncomfortably, miserably sticky. So, I mean, yeah, I get it. And they've been working outdoors moving wood the whole time. So he's probably covered in wood chips and sweat. What do you think happened after this? Well, it's a petty crime because one part of me thought, well, I guess this could still be true. Maybe she joins him somehow. You actually got it right. Okay. She joins him. It's, it's literally like a porno plot. Yeah, it is. So she yeah, did okay. what anyone would do. She tells him how hot of a situation this is. And she demanded that she gets to join. Oh my God. But before she jumps into the fun... She gets into the homeowner's fridge, and she pulls out a jar of blueberry jelly to go with the syrup. <laughs> <laughs> to do what with it? Rub it on her body with a spoon? Yeah, they both just rubbed themselves with syrup and jelly and made sticky, sweaty love. All Tell me that the homeowner came home. Actually, no. Everything went totally fine, except once they were <sighs> finished, he had said, wow, that was awesome. It's really great that I was able to record this whole thing. Oh, that's where it all goes wrong. She asked him to delete the videos. He refused. And then she went to the cops. They seized his phone and found extensive video footage of the woman and him. (sighs) He was charged with voyeurism and was released on a $50,000 bond. Three years later, in May of 2022, Robert had the charges dropped after completing an undisclosed amount of probation. And he sounded pretty cocky about it in the interviews afterwards. Pretty cocky, huh? Oh, oh, yeah. Was he still covered in syrup and blueberry uh, jelly? Probably. (laughs) So nothing happened to her? She didn't get in trouble? No, she got to keep her... Yeah, I mean, she probably lost her job, but... No charges. No charges. She got to keep her anonymity. She was totally fine. I guess there's technically... It's probably technically not illegal to have sex in someone else's home, right? Right. Because that was her crime. 
if there was a crime. Yeah, his crime was just the voyeurism. I, I don't know if it was breaking and entering or if the people that had him doing the work were like, hey, feel free to come in. I don't know. Well, maybe the homeowner said, hey, feel free to come in and have syrupy blueberry jelly sex <laughs> with whomever you want while we're gone. Just make sure to clean up when you're done. And I, I hope they did clean up. That's my biggest question, actually, is did they make it look like nothing ever happened? I can't even imagine how gross that must have been, because like I said, they were sweaty and covered in wood chips and shit, so... The sex by itself is gross. Yeah. Like, and the thing is, it makes me wonder how many of these workers that work in our homes all over the world and these contractors, how many of them are having sex with our food in the middle of our <laughs> home and we don't even know? And if they clean it, no one would have ever known about this if not for the woman complaining to the police. Right. Hmm. So who else has had sex in your home, you know? And with what food? I mean, I have to think in my house, I mean, you got, I'm just trying to think through my pantry. There's definitely syrup in there. We got peanut butter. Uh, there's jelly in there. Mayonnaise. You know, well, mayonnaise, you already got mayonnaise. Am I right? Mm-hmm. What's the sexiest sounding food and why is it linguine? You know, that's what I want to know. <sighs> I will, I think it's, um, is it pastrami? I'm thinking of George and Seinfeld. <laughs> I think he eats pastrami. Yeah. And spicy mustard. Oh, yeah. Man, I just, look, Trevin. Yeah. Full disclosure. I know I said I was a virgin at the top. It's not true. I'm not a virgin. Okay, I'm not okay if you are. But I like sex fine. I like being naked fine. But being naked and having sex in a stranger's home with their food, I just don't know what could get me to that point. And you have to wonder too, this guy started on his own. Do you think this was always his goal? To lure her into doing it so he could film it? If so, that's a bold seduction technique. Oh, yeah. Could go wrong for you quick. It could, yeah, it could go wrong real quick. What year did you say this happened? This one was 2018. And okay, he was 52. pretty recent. And I just wonder, I would hope that they checked that there's no like inside cameras from the homeowner, you know, oh, before yeah. they started. That would suck. Like, they seize the phone, but then the homeowners still have it. Yeah, and maybe they still do. Yeah. Don't know. Okay, fuck. I don't know, Trevin. I don't know if I agree with that being all the way down at number 10, but... Yeah. Well, I guess on a ranking of pettiness. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a ridiculous and a big one. It's probably a greatest hit, but it's not super petty in nature. Okay. Let's knock out another sex one. All right. Number six on the list. We're going to talk about the art of the booty call. Oh, baby. Tell me about the booty call. In Woodbury, New Jersey, 2019. 29-year-old Taja Russell was a horny little devil. Uh -huh. So in the middle of a hot summer night, her lover from a few towns away sends her a booty call text. And like anyone in this day and age... BTB. Yes. She jumped at the opportunity and began to drive to the guy's house. So after the long drive, she gets to his house only to call, text, and knock without any replies. So what would you do if you drove a few towns over and your booty call was nowhere to be seen? So she's there. She's at his house. She's at his house. But he's not responding. I'd assume they're dead. I mean, they want the booty. Yeah. They said they're in for booty, and I'm here with the booty. And yeah, they're if you're not bringing responding. that ass all the way down there, they better be yeah. dead if they're not answering. Yeah, exactly. But I'm guessing he wasn't. He was not dead. He was having a booty call with someone else. <laughs> well, before sending angry texts like, quote, you wasted my money to come out here, quote, <laughs> uh -huh. you smoked, and I see you want to die. <laughs> Surveillance... <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> Surveillance cameras at a nearby Conoco gas station saw Taja enter at 4 a.m. Uh -huh. There she purchased lighter fluid, matches, oh my God. and a lighter. By 4.30 a.m., the man had awoken to his house on fire, where he removed his window and ran all the way to the nearest police station in nothing but a t-shirt. So he was Winnie the Pooh in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The man later told police that Taja was just a side chick that he was having a sexual relationship with, and the man's entire home was destroyed. But luckily, the dog was saved. Okay. Thank you. Taja was arrested with charges of attempted murder, aggravated arson, endangering, and criminal mischief. So this is a petty crime where there was some serious charges yes. going on. Yeah, I, I imagine she got good jail time. Well, I think the punishment for the guy was, uh, your house is fucking burned down. Trevin, try to put yourself in this woman's shoes that burnt the house down. Mm -hmm. Get there. You're mad. You're upset. Fine. That's fine. You're allowed to be upset. But that anger that you feel is sustained for several hours, 
well, I don't know if it's for several hours, for at least a while, mm -hmm. long enough to go to the store, buy all this shit, come back, and nowhere in that time are you thinking, maybe I shouldn't do this? Am I overreacting? Is this a good idea? Is this going to pan out for me? And you still go through with it anyway. You burn this house down. Was it worth it? <laughs> that is, is one what of I would my favorite her. things about these crimes is sometimes people can just prolong this for so long. And I'm like, how do you not just cool off a little? Just find another booty call. Yeah. There are a dime a dozen. Yeah. Go pull out your laptop and get some syrup. Yeah. <laughs> just, just call some landscapers over, have the jelly and the syrup like out invisible so they get the idea. That's kind of like, I remember hearing one time, don't know if this is true, but I remember hearing one time that um, here where I live in Oklahoma, lawns are always, you know, they're grass, they're lawns. Mm -hmm. They're not like somewhere like New Mexico where lawns are, instead of grass, you have like white rocks, you know, think Walt's house in Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. But if you see a house around here that has those rocks instead of grass, that means they are DTF, they're down to fuck, and oh. they are swingers. I did not know that. Don't know if it's true. Some guy that I probably wouldn't trust told me that one time. Anyway, I say all that to say that's going to be the new thing with just leaving the syrup out on the counter <laughs> when the landscapers come over or any other kind of contractor. They come in, they see the syrup, they know it's time to disrobe. Yeah, you're They're just giving like... the all clear. Like, oh, all the shrubs are in the back and I just, I'm leaving the syrup and jelly here in case something comes up. <laughs> wink, wink. I'm going to be, you know, just down the road. And if they don't leave the syrup out, then you pretty much have their implied permission to burn down their house out of anger. Correct. Wow. Okay. These just keep getting more and more absurd. So what's your situation with neighbors? Do you, do you like your neighbors? I'm neutral on my neighbors at the moment. I've definitely had mixed neighbor experiences in my life, but nothing too crazy. I've got some assholes that don't like my dog, and that's not fun for me. Mm. So I can really relate to the story I'm about to tell you at number nine. Okay. And it is a story of the way people deal with neighbors. So in August of 2019, Manchester, New Hampshire, 20-year-old Christy Benoit called the police, stating that her apartment neighbor had broken down her door, came in, punched and scratched her. <laughs> Wait, punched and scratched? Can yeah. you imagine punching someone first, a woman, <laughs> they go down, they're probably maybe semi-conscious, and then you get down on your hands and knees next to them and take your <laughs> nails and just scratch their arm? <laughs> yeah, the story itself already sounds a little wackadoo. I love it. Okay. Well, uh, I don't love it, but you know what I mean. And so the way this actually played out was when she made that call, she actually just went to a third neighbor who had nothing to do with any of this and when just like, beating on their door and like, help me, help me, that mean neighbor over here beat me up. So she used their phone to call the police. So the police show up, okay. random neighbor and Christy are there. Police searched the apartment and found a broken plate, furniture moved, and blood splattered on the living room floor, kitchen, and From bathroom. Mm -hmm. Christy had black eyes, blood stains on her shirt and her arms, and her legs were covered in scratches. So they scratched her legs. A lot of scratches, not just one. Right. Upon further inspection, the cops found that the red liquid splattered about was inconsistent with blood. The officer searched around and found a vial of vampire blood oh used for Halloween God. costumes. She staged the whole thing to frame the neighbor's dog. Well, she staged the whole thing just to blame the neighbor because she didn't like the neighbor. As a result, Benoit was busted and charged with falsifying physical evidence and giving a false report to law enforcement. No punishment was given on that one, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> What number was this one? That was nine. That might be the, mo the most petty. I don't know, <laughs> Trevin. Because <laughs> she made it look like the neighbor broke in and beat her up. Yeah, and she even put on her acting hat and ran into the and brought another neighbor into it, which is... And she had black eyes. Was that makeup? That was makeup. Yeah. <laughs> I would have liked it better if she punched herself to yeah, give herself they, the black eyes. I think they said that the, uh, when the cops were talking to her after they had figured out that the blood was fake, they had noticed that one of her black eyes started to run. <laughs> the cop reaches over and puts his finger along her eye to check, and he takes it back, and he looks at it, he studies it, sniffs it, licks it on his tongue, he says, by God, that's maple syrup. <laughs> <laughs> the old maple syrup can black you, eye. Can you imagine... Well, first of all, he sees the maple syrup and he thinks, oh, okay, she wants to, she wants to fuck. I'll take my clothes off. <laughs> anyway, can you imagine being a woman? I guess she's 20 and all 20-year-olds are idiots. Yeah. No ifs, ands, or buts. They're all idiots. But you think that cops are going to show up at your house and buy this? They're not going to look at the blood? They're not going to look <laughs> at your... Wow. 
And I'm sure she probably flung that all around too. Like it was just, it probably made no sense like the way it was splattered around. Right. Like there should have been a murder there with the amount of blood. That's right. probably better. That's why I call her the, I call her the vampire of Manchester is what I, I like to think of her. Man. I'm just in awe, less so of the fake petty crime itself, more so just the thought process that goes into the, some of this shit. But, oh, yeah. Okay. One of my favorite things about my show is I, I try to find the philosophy behind these people. Like, what makes them tick? Like, why, what mm -hmm. leads a person to do something this ridiculous? Because there just has to be something extra in their character that allows them to do something like this. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite things about your show is? What's that? Co-hosted by Trevin. Oh, thank you. It took forever to find a co-host of that caliber. Yeah. You know, not all my sidekick hosts are bringing stories of women faking apartment beatings with vampire blood. So that's true. I, appreciate it. I do feel like I bring a little something extra to the table other than blueberry jelly. I would hope so. Okay. So let's do a quick recap, though, before we finish. Okay. Number 10, Robert Somley, the syrup and jelly sex story. Yep. Number nine, Christy Benoit, the staged attack by the neighbor. <laughs> number eight you've got the rival butchers in 1914 new york with the cats number seven uh, javon's brown mailing cat poop to jobs that didn't hire him <laughs> six Sorry. taja russell the woman who burned down the house because of the unanswered booty call yeah and we have number four rory susan woods the batman villain beekeeper of the eviction protest batman villain beekeeper I like on the, the number six, the unanswered booty call. I mean, that is, that doesn't feel good to have your booty call go unanswered. No, and it, and it happened at 4 a.m., so she must have just been so ready, you know? I mean, the guy had his, he was Winnie the Poohing it, as you said, just a shirt on, so he probably was wanting it and ready. He just fell asleep. Yeah. Cut the guy a break. It doesn't help that he said that she was a side chick afterwards, though. I bet if she could get out of those cuffs, she probably would have done it again. My favorite part of the whole thing is her text beforehand that said, I see you want to die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Way to incriminate yourself on top of the surveillance video. <laughs> All right. So uh, what, what do you want to do next? Let's do number five. What's a favorite breakfast cereal? Or do you have a favorite bre breakfast cereal? I'm fond of Frosted Flakes. Oh, then you're going to love this. Did I nail the cereal? Uh, like Raisin Bran, but close enough for me. Okay. Close I think enough. Frosted Flakes were also a part of this. So, this is number five. Mm -hmm. In 2014, a man in his mid-40s, Gregory Stanton, was working as a contract worker for the Memphis Kellogg cereal plant. And I'm going to go ahead and assume that he didn't like the job. They didn't really straight up say that. There is one picture of him on the job, and it's him flipping off the camera with two middle fingers. <laughs> okay. But we don't know for sure that he didn't like it. You're right. He hasn't said that in a statement. No motive thing. was officially given. Mm-hmm. He did his time at the job and eventually either quit or his contract was up and he just didn't work for the company anymore. However, after two years of being away from Kellogg's, Gregory decided to upload two videos to worldstaruncut.com. The first was a video of him urinating into a bucket and then dumping that bucket onto the Raisin Bran assembly line. See, motherfucker, this is why... <laughs> okay, go on. The second, he decided to up the ante a little by pissing directly onto the assembly line that the cereal was being poured onto. The videos did go viral, but that did prompt an investigation. In no time, the account was traced back to Greg, where he was sentenced to 10 months in prison and fined $10,000 in restitution for taint, er, <laughs> for taint, for quote, tainting <laughs> consumer products with the intent <laughs> to cause serious injury to the business of any person. I'm sorry, $10,000 doesn't cover it, fam. I could have eaten that cereal. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. As the videos were uploaded two years after the pissing incident, oh. it is assumed that all of the urine-soaked treats had been consumed already. Uh, affected products were Raisin Bran, Rice Krispies, and Puffed Rice Cakes. Okay, I didn't need any of those, I think. But, I mean, the video is... You can see the little, the little blurred nub in the bottom left of the camera, and then you just see a stream just going directly onto the conveyor belt. I have a lot of questions. Okay, first of all, I like how the company had to release which brands of cereal this affected two years later as if anyone could fucking do anything about it now. Right. It's like, oh, I can't go back in time and change the fact that I ate that cereal. But if you were going to invent a time machine and choose a time to go back in time to fix, it might be that. Um, also, why do you wait two years to post it? You know, I wondered the same thing. 
I just figured that he wanted to be cool and get some online attention. I, he could have gotten away with it if it wasn't for his need for the clicks, you know? Yeah, we all feel that need. You and I, Trevin. I mean, we have podcasts. We feel the need for clicks, yeah. downloads, listens. But I tell you, I'm not going to piss on the microphone and take a video <laughs> of it and upload it two years from now. No, these things are expensive. <sighs> I just, I'm, this one just makes me mad. Because I know he hates the company, but mm. you're making the consumer pay for this. Yeah, this was actually talking about clicks. This was the TikTok of mine that did the most or the best ever. And it was just mainly people being like, this guy should have got life or this guy should have been murdered. Like <laughs> life. You know how TikTok be. I don't think he should have got life, but I do think maybe they should have held him down and made him eat pea soaked cereal. Yeah, I think that's only fair. In addition to the jail time and the fine. Of course. They had the 10 months was, I don't know, I go back and forth. Does 10 months seem like enough? I guess. I don't know. Before you told me the sentence, if you would ask me, Nick, how long should this guy go to prison? You know what? Fuck it. I'd probably say two years. Two years? I two mean, years. you should get two years just for being stupid enough to wait two years to tell people you did it. Yeah. If you got caught in the process, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. <sighs> It also just reminds me of the fact that like anytime you're eating anything, there's a chance there's piss on it. There's, and that's why, you know, a recent phenomenon is I feel like since COVID, anytime you do anything, mm-hmm. like if you go to a fast food restaurant and you get fast food, normally you just pay. Now they have a chance to tip. Right. I don't think it should be up to the consumer to tip in those situations. I think the company should pay those people better anyway. But I don't want to tip, but I feel like I have to because if I don't, someone's going to piss in my food. Yeah. Basically, how much you want to spend is how clean you want your food to be. Yeah. And I want it to be clean. I want it to be clean. We did a story about a a dude who dunked his balls in people's salsa as he was door dashing Mexican food to people. So Door dash, that's the other thing, man. Oh, yeah. That one's not on the list, though. (laughs) And dipping your balls in salsa, I'd I'd advise against that. Okay. I need to move on from this topic. (laughs) Jesus fucks. Get ready for the miracle of Mega, a comedy podcast from the staff of a fictional mega church. And, and not only does he fuck, but he's the best at it. I'm Holly Loren. And I'm Greg Hess. Our characters, Holly and Gray, welcome a new guest each week, played by some of the biggest names in comedy and podcasting. Like Scott Ackerman, Lauren Lapkus, Paul Shear, Jason Manzukis, Cecily Strong, and Duncan Trussell. I just love to think about that, the light shining down on all those corpses in the water and Noah just going by and maybe, maybe a mom being like, please, we're running out of energy. Can you please let us on the boat? It's completely improvised and it's devilishly funny. Is there any question you have for us about, you know, what it means to live a life in Christ? I guess, how much do you think is bullshit? There's a new episode every Sunday. Listen and subscribe to Mega, wherever you get your podcasts. Best I ever had. Best I ever. Y'all can do it. Y'all can do it. Y'all can sing along. You know what I'm saying? Here go. Jesus, you the best. Jesus, you're the best. You the best. Jesus, you're Jesus, the best. You the best. Okay, best never mind. Best I ever had. Best wow. I ever had. We just need the top three now. Yes. See, we just want to work down it. Yeah, let's go three, two, one. All right. This one has to do with uh, COVID. So this is fun. Yeah, always fun with COVID. So throughout the year of 2020, during the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic, Ruff Awuni and a Ghana man who goes by the name of John Jacob, (laughs) that was the name he gave. Sure, it's fake. They ran a very profitable scam. Ruff would get Americans' personal information, send it to Ghana, where John was, And he would use that information to file for COVID-19 unemployment relief. And then the funds would go to Ruff's Chicago address. And then they would split 50-50. By early 2021, the scheme had landed them nearly $10 million. Less than some members of Congress probably got, but anyway. (laughs) Sorry. This alone is obviously a crime. But things took a much pettier turn when John realized that he was a swindler being swindled. Love to see it. During the time working together, payments from Ruff started becoming less frequent. John kept reaching out to Ruff about the payments until he eventually quit answering his calls and returning his texts altogether. After realizing that there was no way he would get the money that was owed to him, John called the FBI to tell on his partner. (laughs) During the call, you can find it online, John filled the FBI in on the scheme they were running, explained it. The FBI was dumbfounded. They're like, you can do that? We didn't even know that was a possibility. Oh, my God. He gave them all of Ruff's information, gave him his full name, his address, his phone number. They gave the FBI everything. When asked by the FBI, why are you doing this? 
he said that it was wrong of Ruff to scam money from him. The FBI operator actually kind of giggles to themselves and they're like, you're not upset because uh-huh. you're scamming people. You're upset that he's not sharing the scammed money with you. And the guy, like, completely no awareness is like, yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly the problem here. <laughs> the operator told him wow. that by turning Ruff in, he would also be turning himself in. And he again was like, I don't care. This is on principle. This guy needs wow. to be taught a lesson. So the FBI found Ruff very easily in his Illinois home. Then there was also a big raid on Ghana where a couple different fraud people were arrested, which we can only assume one was John Jacob. Jingleheimer Schmidt. Yes. His name is my name too. Do you know if uh, Mr. Jingleheimer Schmidt got prison time? I mean, surely. Right? Well, he's in, he's in Ghana, right? Yeah, he's in Ghana. So they didn't even give the names of the couple people that they raided and got. Yeah, yeah. But it was a full FBI thing. So I don't even know how that works when it's... I don't know how that works. Like, do, do they go to Ghana prison or... I have no idea. Yeah. No idea. John Jacob, he... You got your money. Move on. Go move to the next scam before this shit takes a turn. But I mean, he, obviously, he's got the skills that pay the bills, so he could get this with somebody else. You know? <laughs> yeah. Someday, I too hope to have skills to pay my bills. Same. I don't have it yet. All right. So All number right. two. So this actually also has to do with a job. Um, have you ever had an issue at work and you felt that somebody just wasn't really taking it seriously for you? Yes. Okay. Well. We'll see if you've handled your issues similarly to this person. Yes, I did. In early 2019, 42-year-old Sarah Soto substitute teacher, or sorry, Sarah Soda substitute teacher, Heather Carpenter, was dealing with a professional complaint towards her place of employment, the Philippi Shores Elementary School. Unfortunately, Heather did not feel the principal was taking proper care of the complaint in question. So what would you do if you felt your boss wasn't taking your issues seriously? I would either let loose a bunch of bees in his office and or place 25 starving cats in his office. How about you give them a good helping of the Florida mudslide? No. (laughs) During the time of this dispute, Heather caught word that the principal's six-year-old daughter was having a birthday party at a local park. The morning of the party, hours before kids were expected to play games and eat hot dogs, Heather showed up sporting rubber gloves and a face mask. There, she took a mixture of human urine and feces and poured it all over the tables and grills of the park's picnic pavilion. She used the rubber gloves to help smear it in and cover all of the surfaces. During her shitty act of revenge, a bystander at the park witnessed the whole thing and called the police. Police investigated and asked the principal if anybody wanted to sabotage the child's birthday party, and the only person she was able to name was Heather. All in all, seven tables and two grills were shitted on. Due to the porous nature of the tables, they were replaced at a cost of $1,400. The grills, each of which cost $650, were replaced to ensure food safety. The labor for all of this cost $150, and because the pavilion was rented for the day, the money was refunded at a cost of $110. All of the damage cost Sarasota County $2,310. Carpenter was arrested and charged with third-degree felony criminal mischief and was unable to serve as a teacher or volunteer at any Sarasota schools. I'm appalled. <laughs> yeah. As you can tell, the, the things I get most upset about are animal cruelty and f- <laughs> fucking with someone else's food, especially a children's birthday party. That child didn't do the shit to you. Right. Oh, God. And she goes there and who, you said a mixture of human urine and human feces. Feces. Who's, which human? They never said. come from. They never said if she robbed the porta potty or if she built up her own supply. I don't know. Mm. It reminds me of that movie, The Help. Did you ever see that? Oh, yeah, with the pie. Yeah, the pie. She serves her pie. And you're also making other people, because if this had worked out the way she had planned it, Mm -hmm. she never would have been caught. No one would ever know. They'd just be eating their beshitted hot dogs and burgers unknowingly. She's making anyone that ever goes to that park suffer too. Yeah, they said that with the porous nature of those tables, they just, it just soaked all the shit right into it. Mm, that'll do it. Trevin, you're just making me upset. I take it back what I said about you being a great host. Uh, well, we can try next time with like uplifting crimes or something. <laughs> uplifting crimes. <laughs> I do have some, her- some heroic crime stories. Okay. One didn't make the list was a guy who went down and cut down all the traffic cameras in his town because he was tired of the uh, red light tickets for people 
So that was kind of heroic, mm. but criminal. Um, He's a vigilante. Exactly. Yeah. They called him the Red Light Robin Hood. The Red Light Robin Hood. That's cute. That's cute. The theme of today is shit. Yeah. Except. We get a lot of poop and butt jokes with our show, for sure. Because that's what yeah, a no, lot of people do. No joke do. matter, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's serious. Okay, number one's going to make me happy, right? It's going to be funny and cute and not upset me. Uh, I would say it's not destructive, but it's just really petty. Okay, good. And again, this is the top 10 pettiest, so not always necessarily the biggest, but you'll see why I call this the pettiest. This one has a little bit of a mystery to it. For nearly three years, elderly couple Ed and Cheryl Patton woke up to find a coffee cup littered in their yard. During this time, Ed collected each cup, filling 10 trash bags with over 300 cups. Wow. The mystery became a bit of a project for the Pattons, as Ed used security cameras, binoculars, and even had index cards where he recorded each event and the time in which he thought it took place. Still, in three years, they were not able to catch this perpetrator. That was until they requested the help of their neighbors. Eventually, one neighbor saw a suspicious minivan stop in front of the Pattons' home where they were able to get the license plate number. With help from the Hamburg police, the neighborhood had a stakeout where the minivan once again passed by to litter a cup. Police pulled over and arrested 76-year-old man, Larry Pope, for the littering spree. According to the Buffalo News, Pope was a former co-worker of Cheryl's. She said she was surprised to find out who the culprit was. Patton, also 76, said she previously worked with her, quote, nemesis at the Fisher Bus <laughs> Service in Hamburg and frequently got into disputes over union-related issues at the company. He hated her for years but she didn't know that he had, he had been acting on it. Pope was charged with harassment and fined for throwing refuse onto a roadway. Larry Pope ended up apologizing, paying the victims $2,800, and completing community service for his petty act. But for three years, he kept up the entire thing. It was always a coffee mug? It was always McDonald's coffee cups, or sometimes oh, different brands. Cups. Okay. So he, <laughs> so he went to get his McDonald's coffee, and he made a special trip out to their house to litter it on their lawn. Wow. Yes, for three years. <sighs> That's petty. You're right. That's number one. Yeah. This guy's 76, too. Yeah. Just He's got to... nothing better to do, I guess. He's probably retired. Yeah. I mean, I think to a certain extent, I bet the family kind of thanks him for giving them something to do during that time. Hmm. Because it yeah. seems like he really went like Harriet the Spy on him, you know, like with his little note Harriet cards and shit. Talk about a throwback. Nickelodeon. <laughs> Harriet the Spy, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Haven't thought about that in 25 years. And they filled the trash bags with all this trash, right? And he held on to them. There's a picture of the guy say. standing next to all of them. I mean, would you hold on to all of them? Try no. To, if this was happening to you? Yeah, why would you do that? And I'm also surprised it took him so long to find the guy. I mean, just put a camera out and you found him. Done. That's what I thought too. In my story when I wrote it, I said... I said that he had somehow mastered the technique of driving without being able to read his license <laughs> because it just didn't make <laughs> yeah. any sense how you can put these cameras up and not get it. It doesn't. Huh. See, the sweetest revenge for me when I take merciless revenge on someone is I want them to know it's me. I want them to know, hey, I'm fucking you over. It's me, Nick, doing it. Mm -hmm. But when you do this kind of mystery version where it's secret, no one knows who it is, that revenge is always so sweet to me, in my opinion, of revenge. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're trying to send a message and make somebody really learn what they did, I mean, they're not going to learn if they don't know why they're getting this treatment. That's how I feel about murder, too. If I'm going to go murder someone, not that I ever would, Trevin, never mm -hmm. have, never will, but if I was going to go murder someone, once you shoot them, they're dead. They don't even know that you murdered him. They don't even know that you got back at him. Fuck you, I killed you. Ah, shit, you're dead. Now you don't know that I killed you. Yeah, what do you think about that? Oh, you can't tell me. Yeah, there's a real hole in the logic there. We're not going to solve murder logic today. No, probably. not this episode. Yeah. Okay, Trevin, I want you to go back through the top 10. All right. Number 10, Robert Somley, the syrup and jelly sex story that was secretly recorded. Christy mm. Benoit, the fake vampire blood staged attack. Eight, the 1914 butcher cat heist. Mm -hmm. Seven, the Javon's Brown mailing cat poop to the places that didn't hire him. Cat poop, Unabomber. Oh, yeah, Unabomber. Uh, number six, Taja Russell, the unanswered booty call that ended in flames. Mm. Number five, Gregory Stanton, the Kellogg's pisser. 
That one just pisses me off. Yeah. It, Go ahead. Yeah. Literally. Uh, number four, Rory Susan Woods, the beekeeper Batman villain. Mm-hmm. Number three, quote, unquote, John Jacob, the Ghana man who turned in his own partner. Number two, the teacher who poured piss and shit all over a park to ruin a birthday party. <laughs> and number one, the old man Larry Pope who littered in the same yard for three years because he hated an old coworker. On a list of top 10 pettiest petty crimes, I do have to admit, number one and two make sense. Those belong at number one and two. As for the story I find most compelling, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the story that I'll think about long after this episode (laughs) ends, several of them, but I think that one is number 10, the people that just (laughs) started having (laughs) sex with syrup and jelly during a landscaping gig. Why are they even inside? First of all, I never answered that. They're landscapers. Yeah, that was a favorite one of my... I love doing sex stories because the sound effects that can go along with those, especially mm. when you're talking about the squishiness of jelly and whatnot, uh, there's, yeah. there's a lot of uh, room for me to play on, on the audio field of that. That's true. I love a good squish. love a good squish sound. Trevin, uh, this was amazing. Thank you so much for bringing this list. And I think the listeners, if they enjoyed this episode, they would definitely enjoy your show since you covered all this shit on there. So can you tell us more about your show again, where to find it, uh, anything else you want to share? Yeah. Live Laugh Larceny. You can find us anywhere you get your podcast. The stories are my pride and joy. I love coming up with the philosophy behind petty crimes. I've thought about writing a philosophy book based on nothing but petty crimes because there's just so much... You can learn about the world through people who have sex with syrup and jelly and stuff like that. And there's an endless supply of those stories, too, is the other beautiful thing. Yeah, and so we kind of mix it all up. If you're a person who likes storytelling podcasts, we do that. If you're a person who likes audio dramas, our sound effects are like that. If you like the edutainment side of things, we always do a little bit of a fun fact. And and we do, uh, yeah, we do top fives sometimes. Because I, too, like to just learn a little bit of something every time I listen to something. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a variety with what we do, but it's all around comedy. If you don't like true crime, that's okay, because most days I don't. My mm-hmm. co-host absolutely loves it. She is your typical true crime person, and I'm the guy who decided to bastardize it with sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> Just really impressed with the kind of storytelling nature of the petty crimes in the episodes. It's so well done. So yeah, highly recommend it to everyone. Live, laugh, larceny. Trevin. We'll have to have you back on sometime. Oh, I would love to. I love doing these things. And if you ever need someone to come on and complain about why people shouldn't fuck with other people's foods in a factory, I'm your guy. All right. Hey, if you ever have a petty crime of your own and you want to tell it, I would love to build sound around it. God, I've done a lot of my own petty crimes. We'll discuss some of those off air and you tell me if they fit. Anyway, Trevin, thank you again. To the listeners, thank you so much for listening. I'll be back next week with episode 234 fan favorite Anna Keller will be back on the show to guess a top 10 list that I bring until then thank you very much goodbye